Hello, I'm Dirty Harry Harris, the program director of the radio station here at the Daybreak Star Radio Network. Super excited for this conversation interview opportunity here on our Zoom channel. This interview will be uh, seen on our website, daybreakstarradio.com. You can go to our blog. Also, we'll be positioning it and sharing it on our uh, social media as well. This morning, I'm joined by attorney uh, Pat Donahue from uh, Spokane, Washington. We should also give you the credit, Pat, criminal defense attorney, Pat Donahue from Spokane, and also Leo, the chair of the 2022 uh, ballot initiative called ADAPT. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? Good. How are things over in Spokane, Pat? Uh, wonderful, sunny, getting cold, getting dark yeah. a little early. Yeah. Um, no complaints. Yeah. And Leo, how about you? I'm good. I just got out of the mountains after four days um, up and getting some health and healing in Deming, Washington. So I'm feeling invigorated. Deming? I don't, I don't know if I've ever actually been to Deming. I've been to Spokane, but I don't know if I've been to Deming. So, well, welcome yeah. aboard. And I know we have, uh, we have some important topics to, uh, to cover today. Leo, let me uh, pass the ball to you first, and if you could uh, provide some background on you, and uh, you know what what you're hoping our our, our listeners and our audience uh, get out of get out of the important messages that we're talking about today. Sure. Um, so I'm a therapist in Washington State. I'm a licensed uh, family and marriage therapist, and also I work with chemical dependency to help um, currently prostitution survivors in South King County. Um, and I started working in the decriminalization effort for entheogens, which are plant medicines that can help heal us, um, about two years ago, and doing mostly grassroots efforts. And um, I used to work at United Indians, and I used to work for the Alishek Institute there doing cultural-based counseling. Um, Pete Blair was my mentor. He wrote a lot of the uh, mental health curriculum for Native children, for Snoqualmie and other tribes um, that have in, like uh, utilize now uh, mental health practices that are more attuned to native children, especially native urban children. So um, I went on to work in Indian child welfare and did uh, drug and alcohol treatment at uh, Seattle Indian Health Board. And my father's a small part Penobscot Indian, not enough that I uh, really identify, but I remember I had a, a cool mentor at United Indians. It was a woman by the name of Alice Two. Her husband used to run the food program um, at Seattle Indian Health Board. And she always said that the urban Indian child sometimes grapples with a sense of acceptance by the Indian community. And she said, if you're one part uh, Indian, then you're you know, part of the community. So she was very welcoming and loving. She spoke at my mother's funeral. So I, I literally stayed connected with the native community even if I went off into this plant medicine stuff. And then I realized, hey, I could bring my native American friends and allies and people that I think need to have their voice shared in this community. So. As we started the ADAPT effort, which is the statewide psilocybin um, access similar to 109 in Oregon, they're just pretty much the same thing in so many ways. Um, we just kind of had to stop along the way and think about grassroots activism and how do we include people of color and people who've been marginalized. We know people of color have been largely impacted by the drug war and it's those families that have been destroyed. And I think native families certainly are part of that demographic. So, um, you know, my heart is there. I'm trying to uplift these people. I think I tend to have a lot of personal social anxiety. I'm very open if people talk to me about it. But um, I have really enjoyed and thrived from being part of these, you know, these amazing people and what they're doing. And what's so beautiful to me is like, it's like stone soup. You know, it takes one, each one of us to contribute something before we, you know, before we know what we have a soup. So I think people are struggling with drug and alcohol dependency. And even yesterday I had like a little argument with my Russian friend and she's like, you know, drug issues need to be like in Russia where they just like shoot you and, you know, put you in jail or shoot you like in China or something if you're a drug addict. And I'm like, oh my goodness. But um, I understand she's frustrated with how people are like out of control and they're suffering in this world, especially under COVID and they're depressed and they're anxious. And so how do we get these medicines out there and also educate people? Because a lot of people, you know, when I worked at United Indians, it was the well Briety movement. And that was like really like pushing this only 12 step um, process, but that only has like a six to 10% advocacy, I mean, um, efficacy. And so um, I think sometimes it can be a hard conversation to bring to native people, a conversation around plant medicine, because they're like, wait a minute, like you, the colonizer are going to come to talk to me like about plant medicine. Like um, it's a, it's a tough territory because 
um, it, a lot of times there's entitlement in the psychedelic community and a lot of white men are gearing up to make a lot of money on this, to put it bluntly, a lot of wealthy people are get, uh, gearing up to make money with this. Currently Forbes magazine did an article on a doctor who's a friend of mine who's doing a, a clinical trial, the first in the United States for human beings with uh, psilocybin. And that's partially being funded, excuse me, or mostly being funded by big pharma because they're getting ready for like a sublingual, uh, like a, a very small psilocybin pill you can take as opposed to taking natural psilocybin. And, you know, my heart doesn't always rest easy with that stuff, but I think the more we have, um, you know, communities like yours and um, the people that care about plant medicine, speaking up about, um, one thing that's really cool about Haley Marie Salazar, she's formed a nonprofit to work on sharing different strains of fungi medicine. So sharing it with different people and preserving these indigenous like access and sharing and community and not uh, letting these patents happen. So uplifting her voice and indigenous voice, and um, I could just go on forever. <laughs> well, you know, Leah, I must, I must, you know, give you a lot of gratitude to, you know, be able to share your hard work in terms of what, you know, the what, what's being constructed at the current moment with you and, you know, the rest of the members of the team here. I mean, I, I can, I can imagine that uh, with with all the struggles that we all have within our daily lives, it must. Uh, you know, you must get some some enjoyment from seeing, you know, the work that's gone into the, to the mission up to this point. So thank you. Uh, Pat, I'd like to uh, pass the ball to you here, please. I know you're uh, over in Spokane, Washington. And if you could please provide some background. And uh, you mentioned before we before we hopped on the air for this interview, you're trying, you're ultimately looking to transition yourself. I'll, I'll always maintain an active defense practice. Um, but before we kind of get into where I am now, I, uh, I found I found Washington State in Spokane through uh, through Gonzaga. Uh, graduated from law school there. Became a licensed attorney back in 2014. Uh, my path to law school um, was set in motion probably well long before I was born with the, the war on drugs. Um, I've been deeply passionate about finding a new approach to that for a long time. Um, and that sort of led me down the road to, uh, to law school. And I, I knew in law school, I wanted to be a defense attorney. I knew that I wanted to stand for my brothers and sisters um, who stood accused, especially of nonviolent possession drug crimes. Um, and I, I've just, I've had a very, a very deep belief for a very long time that this incarceration model and this incar incarceration approach, especially to substance abuse was, was deeply flawed. Um, I've been in, tremendously encouraged recently as more studies have come out to show that psilocybin in particular um, may be a powerful tool when used in conjunction with therapy for alleviating um, you know, the, the deep suffering that's being felt by many of our brothers and sisters in the community. Uh, in 2016, I, I founded Donahue Law, which is, which is my, my defense practice, and did exclusively criminal defense until about early 2020. Um, in early 2020, um, decriminalized nature's movement started popping up, and I got involved locally in Spokane, and, and then again on the state level here, uh, to sort of help draft a new a new way forward. Um, I'm not pretending for a second that I've got all the answers, um, but I I certainly think that if we all get together and, and do our best, it would be difficult to create a model more flawed than the one we have now. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that we can all take our our different perspectives and our, our strengths and and work together and, and work together toward a brighter future here. That's great, Pat. And you know, kudos to you because I know you look, your job is not an easy job. It could, you know, I have friends who are lawyers, especially on the criminal side, and it can be stressful. You know, people are really, you know, relying on you to to work your magic and to have the, you know, the proper communication skills and the experience and the skill set. And expertise to uh, you know be speaking to a room full of people to you know award someone's freedom back to them. It's a stressful. It's a stressful thing. Can be challenging. Uh, nobody nobody calls me on their best day. Nobody calls me on a winning streak. And, and you know I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, there's days that you wake up and you know whether you want to put that jersey on, you know that you've got a mission to to handle. You've got you know it's 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 not. It's not one of those jobs where you can like, you know, put it on hold for 20 minutes at your leisure. You know, you've got, you've got people like a doctor, but especially on the criminal side, it's, uh, it's, you know, pe people are really relying on you to, to, to make a, 
to change their lives. Thank you. The, the gravity of the situation, I mean, I, I have these deep passions that fuel me, but also the gravity of the situation and the, the potential consequences uh, give me motivation and, and energy to keep the afterburners burning uh, and to keep, to keep fighting for what I believe is right. And again, standing for my suffering brothers and sisters on what's oftentimes the worst day of their life. And how can people get involved? You know, how can Washington State, how can people nationally get involved? Who do they need to reach out to? What do you need from people? Just, you know, break it down for me. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'll jump in there. The initiative um, requires about 360,000 signatures during a lingering pandemic by July 3rd, 2022. So that means that we are going to need um, volunteers and volunteers should be able to sign up as of tomorrow at adapt-wa.org. It's very easy to remember. And there is also information at that website, adapt-wa.org, that has uh, wonderful information about our fundraiser, which is December 7th at Daybreak Star. Uh, we're featuring lots of doctors and scientists and attorneys like Pat and uh, other Native and Indigenous speakers, um, especially two people from the veterans community. There's two large veteran groups that are currently uh, 501c3s in Washington that are using psilocybin to treat PTSD with veterans, and two of them will be speaking at this event, and they are currently helping uh, soldiers uh, find uh, relief from um, ongoing uh, PTSD. So, um, and then we're accepting donations for the silent auction at the Daybreak Star fundraiser. And um, those can be sent to Sean at adapt-wa.org. And that's gonna be great. That's right here at our headquarters where the radio station is coming up December 7th at the, at the, right here. And uh, you've got a lot of great speakers. Uh, uh, DJ, I'm actually, it'd be cool if I can actually make it myself. I'd like to uh, meet uh, DJ Ben uh, Affleck. He's uh, the owner of Hoffman Enterprises. and. I was reading his bio and he's got, you know, quite the entrepreneurial mindset. He does. He's really a fascinating person and I'm really excited. Uh, he has lots of ideas for the fundraiser. And what's so beautiful is, like I said, it's like that um, stone soup idea because we have so many different creative types. We have a woman coming from um, Olympia who led the women's march down there and is a poet slash performer and just all these people reaching out from all around the state that want to participate in some way. We have a lot of people who've suffered through addiction like to Suboxone and morphine or, you know, just ongoing opiate addiction, abusing, yep. you know, pharmaceutical opiates and that kind of thing, who are also going to be speaking about how plant medicine kind of help break some of those cycles. And I think so many of us have someone in our family or multiple people in our families, you know, that just have ongoing struggle with addiction. Um, and I think we're all addicted to something. Gabor Mate has made a huge impact, I think, all across the therapeutic community. And, you know, he used to do ayahuasca with people in um, downtown Vancouver and was really helping addiction there and a lot with uh, First Nation people. But he kind of got shut down with that. But he talks a lot about, you know, the impacts of, um, you know, going into the pain with people and, and allowing them to process the pain. And a lot of us, um, you know, have people in our families that could really benefit from these medicines. And that's great. And can you um, talk about the medical benefits and uh, sacred benefits for us as well, either Leo or Pat? Real quick, I think there's kind of actually two, um, you're talking about two different frameworks. I, I actually believe that the sacred benefits or the, the sacred benefits are a religious liberty that yep. I believe is actually protected by our constitution and, and precedes any enforcement. I, I truly believe, and I think case law will, will support, and hopefully all the way to the Supreme Court will support, that the religious and ceremonial usage of, of psychedelics, in particular psilocybin, is a protected right of ours that precedes most government regulation. Sort of separate from that, we have this, this um, um, a, a more legalization framework or a psilocybin services framework uh, where there will be more of a, uh, a regulated market or a regulated economy, if you will, um, where a consumer will hopefully be able to approach a professional um, in a more clinical setting and have information. And, and I'm personally hopeful that this will sort of appeal to a broad range of individuals. There are going to be, there are going to be people who are, are not comfortable, not acquainted with uh, the shamanistic traditions. And, and those people are, are going to are going to really benefit from a more clinical environment in a clinical setting. Conversely, there are people who have been, many people and becoming more vocal about it, who have been practicing um, these religions and these religious practices for, for at least a decade, um, many, many, many much longer than that. 
um, in these ceremonial settings. And the individual who's well versed in a ceremonial setting um, may not benefit as much from a clinical setting. So I don't think there's a, a one size fits all model here. And I'll let kind of Leo riff on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I just think about like two different types of people. I think about my friend Renee, whose husband owns a black business in Seattle and goes to an all black church. And, you know, she's open, but also kind of has just kind of believed that like Nixon's drug war, like all drugs are bad and like uh, crack got planted in black communities. And so, you know, just you know, the concept is that all drugs are bad. And so when I think about people that would be reassured by um, having some kind of structure and having like a doctor or a nurse present, um, I think about, you know, someone out in OMAC and maybe they have a, um, you know, a friend who's like, oh, you know, we can go do mushrooms and just pick them because they grow here. You know, they grow. This is part of the Pacific Northwest. And I, I'm really um, excited about these native uh, men that are talking at our conference, um, our, our, you know, event in terms of they're talking about how native people use these medicines, you know, oftentimes uh, native people, um, di you know, it isn't talked about that they use these medicines. So um, anyway, the, um, the point is that there isn't really uh, an opportunity for someone out in OMAC, maybe if their friend says to them, let's go and pick some mushrooms and go do them. Maybe this person doesn't feel comfortable, you know, maybe she's had a lot of grief or like lost children or had miscarriages and, you know, and has a lot of stuff like trauma that might come up for her or I don't know. I mean, she just doesn't feel comfortable. So that's OK. And, and she shouldn't have to just be comforted by something like decriminalization. Um, I think where I'm like the most concerned is that we get enough signatures from those people that are just kind of on the fence. I have another friend whose husband went to prison for uh, cannabis. And so for her, when I talk to her about this, it becomes very triggering for her because she, you know, the drug war took away her husband. And, and so she just says, oh, all drugs are bad. And I have to kind of say, educate her or, or do that in gentle ways. So I think folks who um, need the reassurance of structure and uh, rules and protocols and, you know, an advisory board and oversight by the Department of Health and oversight by the Cannabis uh, Industry Board, which is currently um, overseeing cannabis, obviously, um, that kind of structure and that kind of like having an objective um, third party that's going to be uh, auditing us, like those kinds of structural uh, mechanisms really um, support and make people feel more comfortable with exploring psychedelics, you know, even if they're natural psychedelics like mushrooms. Awesome. Totally, well, totally, oh, please go ahead, Pat. Please. Totally agree with what Leo said. And, and at the heart of also what she said to, was education about this. Um, you know, we've tried just say no for 50, 51 years now, and that's failed us. We need to switch to a model, just say no, K-N-O-W. And all the information we have, especially about psilocybin, is that this is an incredibly safe molecule, as long as it's done in the right context. And we need to make sure people have access to not only the molecule that they're intending to take, um, but to the information that allows them to have a safe and healthy and productive experience. Awesome. Well, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience chatting with you guys. I've learned a tremendous amount. I really appreciate you both taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to me here at the Daybreak Star Radio Network. Looking forward to uh, getting this interview uh, properly bound up onto our uh, blog on our website, daybreakstarradio.com. Any final closing words from Leo or Pat that you would like to mention? Um, just that right now, if you look at the um, the folks that are headed to the emergency room, cannabis uh, is above uh, mushrooms. So mushrooms are the lowest uh, drug, if you will, that, that sends people to the emergency room in a panic. And cannabis is sending far more people to the emergency room. And, you know, cannabis right now is being uh, governed by people who've had money and who've had access to money for a long time. I think that people in the Native community um, were left behind in some ways from the cannabis movement and taking advantage of capitalism, which is basically the system that we're all kind of locked into. So I would just encourage folks to have an open mind and have an open heart and please come to our event. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Pat. And uh, if I, you know, from the radio station, if Sherry and I can uh, continue to help in any way for moving in the future, please, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Take care. Bye-bye.